All right, Chemistry 3101. Last class, we started this chapter on acids and bases, and I just want to quickly review some of what we discussed last class. We talked about the Bronsted-Lowry definition of acids and bases, and a Bronsted acid is a substance that donates a proton, H+, whereas a Bronsted base is a substance that accepts a proton. And so we spent some time labeling acids and bases, and from there, we talked about what a conjugate acid and a conjugate base is. So a conjugate acid results when a base accepts a proton and a conjugate, um, uh, sorry, a conjugate acid results when a base accepts a proton and a conjugate base results when an acid gives up a proton. If you're ever confused about those definitions, all you have to do is think about the reaction going backwards, right? Because usually students can remember what an acid and a base is. So if we look at the two products in our reaction, and if we think about the reaction in reverse, who's giving up the proton? Well, it's this substance, therefore it must be an acid. And this substance is accepting a proton, and so that must be a base. And so it's easier to, or sometimes easier to label conjugate acids and conjugate bases when we think about it in that way. From there, we talked about curved arrows in reactions. And if you remember in chapter two, we spent a lot of time talking about curved arrows in resonance structures, and those were just um, showing the flow of electrons or the, I shouldn't say the flow, it should uh, represented the delocalization of electrons around a molecule or ion. And in this section, we actually looked at the actual flow of, of electrons in an actual chemical reaction. So where we had bonds being broken and bonds being formed. And so we discussed um, the physical movement of the electrons. And we talked about how learning how to draw reaction mechanisms is very important in organic chemistry. And we did a couple of examples like this one here um, where we have a reaction between a base which of course is accepting the proton and then we have our acid this is acetic acid here which is donating a proton there we go so we got some practice on that and that brings us to section 3.3 which deals with quantifying acidity so two things we're going to look at this morning are quantifying that means using numbers to rationalize acidity or numbers to explain relative acidity and then we're going to look at qualifying acidity and that's just going to be um, us being able to look at a molecule or an ion and being able to just look at the structure and saying you know this acid would be stronger than this acid or this should be a stronger base than this right just by inspection of the molecule so when it comes to quantifying acidity you probably remember ka right the acid dissociation constant from general chemistry too. You would have spent a lot of time talking about equilibria in that chapter. And so when you take an acid, just some kind of generic acid, it could be a strong acid or a weak acid. Since there's equilibrium arrows, I guess this is a weak acid, but that's neither here nor there. When you take an acid and you put it in water, what is it gonna do? It's gonna donate the proton to water to form hydronium. And of course, you're gonna be left over with the conjugate base. Based off of your skills, no pun intended, from general chemistry too, if I was to ask anybody who's hearing the sound of my voice to write out an equilibrium expression, okay, for this reaction that's presented on this slide, I would expect you would be able to write this out really quickly and say the K equilibrium is going to be equal to the product of the concentration of the products divided by the product of the concentration of the reactants. Now, the concentration of water remains fairly constant. If you look at our book, it says that it's around 55 and a half molar. Well, if we factor out that water, so essentially here we're taking K equilibrium multiplied by the concentration of water, which is a constant, we get our Ka value, which again is the acid dissociation constant of an acid that's dissolved in water. Now, if we have a strong acid, I have a question for you. If I have a strong acid, like what's a strong acid? I'm sure most students would you know, something like sulfuric acid might come up to them or hydrochloric acid. These are strong acids. Would my Ka value be bigger than one or smaller than one if I had a strong acid? Could anybody answer that for me? Bigger. Yeah, absolutely, right? Because if you think about what the purpose of an acid is, the purpose of an acid of this guy right here is to donate a proton, right? So the stronger that the acid is, the greater ability it will have to donate protons and therefore the equilibrium will lie more to the side of the products, right? If you have a weak acid, that's only gonna donate a little bit of products like that. You know, I didn't plan on um, uh, getting out of my slides here and using my camera, but I'll just show you something kind of, I don't know, I think it's amusing. 
But something that I came up with for my students a number of years ago, and I might be dating myself here. Okay. Let's see here. Seems to be okay. All right. Can everybody see my camera? Do you guys remember the old thing in videos where they used to do like making it rain, you know, making it rain money? Okay. Well, if you think about an acid, what's the purpose of an acid? The purpose of an acid is to make it rain protons, right? And if you think about a strong acid, a strong acid is like making it rain, making it rain lots of protons really hard, right? A strong acid is powerful. Whereas a weak acid is going to be more like making it rain. Pretty weak, you know, it's not going to donate a lot of protons. I don't know if that's going to be helpful for you at all, but please don't include that in my, uh, in my review. Anyhow, so making it rain protons. I think about a strong acid. Its function is to make it rain protons and it does it very well. Whereas a weak acid is only going to make it rain a little bit of protons. Anyhow, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the, just the concept of a strong acid will donate a lot of protons, whereas a weak acid will be a weak proton donor. All right, cool. Good. Okay, I think we got that one under our hat. Well, from there, let's move on and talk a little bit more about this whole concept of quantifying acidity. Because when you actually calculate Ka values, and again, this is something that you would have done in general chemistry too. You would have spent some time calculating Ka values. Well, you probably remember that they have a wide range of values for acids, okay? You can have a really big number like 10 to the power of 10, or you can have a really, really small number like 10 to the power of negative 50. Now, I don't know about you, but I know about me, and I know that I would probably be the first guy to lose track of that many zeros. Let's say it was 10 to the power of negative 47, and I had to write those, you know, come on, I would lose track of that. But the whole idea is that Ka values cover a really wide range, okay? We can have strong acids that donate a lot of protons, so the number or the, the value of our Ka is going to be really high, or if we have a weak acid, the value of our Ka is going to be really small. And so how do we deal or how do we rationalize or how do we, you know, manipulate such big and such small numbers? Well, what we do is we take the negative log of those numbers, right? If we take the negative log of the Ka, we get what's called the pKa. I know that you all remember from general chemistry too that pH is equal to the negative log of the concentration of protons. So if we do the same thing for Ka, right, pKa is the negative log of a Ka. Well, what that does is it gets us to just focus in on the exponents, right? Negative 50 to 10. And when we take the negative log, we get numbers that range from negative 10 all the way to 50. So what does that tell you? That since our pKa values range from that negative 10 to, to uh, 50, since we're taking the negative log, what does that mean? That means that the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid. So this is going to be a strong acid, something that has a pKa that goes all the way down to negative 10. And if we have a pKa that's really high, that's going to be a weak acid, okay, a very weak acid. Now, sometimes it's counterintuitive, right? We think a big positive number might, would be stronger. Well, here it's the opposite, right? Remember, you're taking the negative logarithm, okay? So a low negative number is a strong acid, okay? Like something like sulfuric acid has a pKa of minus 9, okay? Whereas something like an alkane is going to have a really high pKa because it's not a strong acid. So if we look at this table here, this comes from our textbook, it's table 3.1, and it might be a little difficult to see on my slide here, but I'll zoom in, uh, in on it uh, in a second here. It says that there's more pKa values on the inside cover of your textbook. Well, I'm not crazy. I know that you're probably using the E textbook, but if you look in the appendix, I believe, or at the beginning or something, there's a whole um, pKa value table, which is much more exhaustive than this one here. Remember that each pKa unit represents an order or a magnitude or a power of 10, right? So every time you go, like let's say you had something that had a pKa of 12 and then something else that has a pKa of 14. Well, if you take 14 minus 12, you get two. So that means it's 10 to the power of two, which is 100 times, right? So if you had, a, if you had an acid with a pKa of 12, it's, it's 100 times more acidic than something with a pKa of 14. All right, so just some simple math there. Here's an example. Let's say you compare sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid. They're both strong acids. Absolutely, they are. However, sulfuric acid is stronger, right? There's a difference of two between negative nine and negative seven. And so since sulfuric acid has a more negative pKa, it is 100 times stronger acid than hydrochloric acid. Well, let's take a look at the values that are in this table. Let's zoom in on them. The strongest acid. And you might be wondering, you know, Mr. Dan, are there stronger acids than 
sulfuric acid, right? That's what this is. This is H2SO4. It's just the Lewis structure or partial Lewis structure drawn here. Yeah, there's acids that are stronger than sulfuric acid, but it's one of the strongest acids that we ever see in this class. So sulfuric acid has a pK of minus nine. Um, and it, we have the conjugate phase shown here. Also, you would have seen this species show up a few times when we were practicing drawing um, uh, curved arrows the other day. When we were drawing curved arrows in a reaction mechanism, this is like a protonated carbonyl, right? You guys remember that a carbonyl is when you have a carbon doubly bound to an oxygen like that. Well, when you protonate it, it's got a really low pK. It turns out that that is very acidic. Okay, it's got a pK of around minus 7.3. Um, this is hydrochloric acid, pK of minus 7. The next one is a hydronium, H3O+, plus, has a pK of minus 1.74. Now, most of the time, I'll probably just say minus 2 uh, or maybe ma minus 1.7. I don't know if I go down to the hundredths place a whole lot. The next one is acetic acid. But notice that this is a carboxylic acid. So generally speaking, a carboxylic acid, not always, but a lot of the times, okay, will have a pK of around 5-ish, okay? 4.75 is close enough to five, you know, so acetic acid. And of course, you know, you see the conjugate base. The next one here, this is called a 1,3-dicarbonyl. 1,3-dicarbonyl. And you actually see 1,3-dicarbonyls, right? And the reason we call it a 1,3 is because you have one, two, three. You have a carbonyl at one, you have a carbonyl at three. We actually see a lot more of these in organic chemistry too. And you might be like, oh, Mr. Dion, with the organic chemistry too again, it's not the class I signed up for. Okay, well, let me just explain something quickly here. The reason why you see this show up in this chapter, because you will see the 1,3-dicarbonyl show up a bunch of times in the practice problems, is because what David Klein wants you to understand is that when you deprotonate here, you have a doubly stabilized carbanion, right? You should know that there's partial negative here and partial negative here, right? You should be able to draw the two resonance structures. So that's his, his point there. Anyhow, the next one is a phenol. Right, this molecule is just plain old phenol. It's got a pK of around 10. Now, the way that I remember that is I think phenol like that, and that's the number 10 backwards. I don't know, just kind of one of those weird things that I do. Anyhow, we have its conjugate base. Then you have a bunch of alcohols, right? You've got water, ethanol, and you've got terbutanol. And you notice that all of their pKs are close, right? But they're not the exact same, are they? Right? You can see that water is a stronger acid than ethanol, not by much, but by a little bit. And you see that ethanol is 100 times stronger acid than this alcohol, terbutanol. So that's kind of interesting. Anyhow, let's keep moving on from there. And let's continue on with that table. So we ended off somewhere around here. We talked about um, ethanol and terbutanol. After that, we have acetone, which is a ketone. So this is you know, just a ketone. And this is the alpha proton of a, of a ketone. Anyhow, uh, acetone is a pK of around 19. The next one is acetylene, but generally speaking, an alkyne, the terminal hydrogen on an alkyne will have a pKa of around 25. Um, the next one is ammonia or an amine, right? I taught you what an amine is, so an amine or ammonia will have a pKa around 38. Um, the next one is ethylene, but, you know, you can just say if you have an sp2 hybridized carbon-hydrogen bond, the same thing here, it's an, like an sp hybridized carbon-hydrogen bond was 25, an sp2 it's going to be around 44. Like, for example, um, you can take these values and, you know, they're not always going to be hard and fast. Like, for example, if you have an aromatic ring, all the six protons here, I think their pK is around 40. But either way, that's close enough to 44 that you would be able to figure it out. So pK would be around 40-ish here. And then the last one is just a straight-ahead alkane. Right? This is just ethane. And ethane, you can see, is a very, very weak acid. Right? It doesn't donate a lot of protons, does it? But if you're very astute, okay, and the, again, the pK of the sp3 hybridized carbon-hydrogen bond is around 50, okay? But if you're very astute, and I know you all are, something that you all probably noticed when I was going through this list is you're like, Mr. Dion, you're not talking a whole heck of a lot about the conjugate bases, but something I know you all noticed is that this relationship that the stronger or the strongest acids produce the weakest conjugate bases, whereas... The opposite is true, right? The weakest acid, which is the alkane on here, produces the strongest base. You know, you think about strong bases that you learn in general chemistry, right? What's the strong base that comes up all the time in general chemistry is hydroxide, okay? And you'd be 100% correct in saying that. 
But here we go. We have a base that's even stronger. Okay, this would be in, um, the conjugate base of an alkane. And if you're wondering, you know, will we ever see a base like that? Yeah, we will. Yeah, absolutely, we will. Yeah. And we'll use those kinds of bases. Now, what I want you to do before your next quiz, before quiz three, is you need to memorize all of the values on here. Okay. I know it might sound a little daunting at first, but I promise you, and I don't like to promise things to people, but I promise you that if you memorize these, um, it will be it will be so handy for you as you move through the class. Not only will it be necessary for the next quiz, but if you remember these when we're into chapter eight, if you remember these when you're in organic chemistry too, whether you take it with me or with anybody else or you take it in another school, if you remember these when you get to organic chemistry too, you're, you, my friend, will be in good shape, okay? These will come in super handy, okay? Because nobody can argue with these pKa values. You know, if I ask you a question about acids and bases and you come back to pKa values, nobody can, nobody can argue with you. If you know the pKa value, you'll always be right, right? They're, they're set in stone, okay? Uh, there we go. Now, in terms of the basicity, I just kind of put this slide together where it shows some, you know, just a random selection of acids here and a really wide variety. We go from sulfuric acid to, to hydrochloric, to ammonia, to ethylene, to ethane. But again, the whole point of this is that the stronger the acid, the weaker its base. Okay, the stronger its acid, it's weaker its base. Now, let me make a comment about this. Okay, and you're going to need to really stick with me here for a second. So if you're not paying attention, and I know you all are, but I was a student for a long time, and I know that my, atten my um, attention would drift at points. I want you to just try to bear with me for a few seconds here, because this is a really important concept. And I know it might sound simple to you, but, you know, sometimes simple, the simplest things are, are the most important, you know? Okay. So if we think about a strong acid like sulfuric acid, everybody who's hearing the sound of my voice knows about sulfuric acid, right? You all took general chemistry one. You all passed general chemistry two. Very difficult class. You all know that sulfuric acid is a strong acid. Like, yeah, yeah, if it dissociates in water, I draw an arrow in one direction because it's so strong. Well, what's left over is the hydrogen sulfate ion. Okay, now you can just memorize and say, okay, well, the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. But why is this such a weak base? Right? What's the purpose of a base? Remember that a base was a proton acceptor? So if we think about how badly this hydrogen sulfate ion wants to accept a proton, it is, it must be really indifferent. It must be really like, meh, you know, I don't care about picking up a proton. Why? Because it's so stable. Why is it so stable? Well, for one thing, you could draw a bunch of resonance structures here, couldn't you? Right? You could draw one there, you could draw one over here, right? You have all these electronegative oxygen just sucking that electron density away. So the reason why it's a weak base is because it's stable, okay? Once it loses the proton, it's, it's, it's still kind of good. It's still kind of like, okay, I lost the proton, but hey, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with my identity that I'm a conjugate base, okay? All right, if you go to hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. Why is the chloride such a weak base? Because chloride is a pretty electronegative element, right? It's got an electronegativity of around three. And therefore, it's pretty content to have that negative charge. Now, if we skip ahead to something like this conjugate base up here, right? Why is an alkane like ethane, why is it going to be such a crappy proton donor? Because once you make this base, it's, it's in like panic mode. It's like threat level midnight. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. But um, anyhow, so it's, it's like super uncomfortable. It's like I got a negative charge on a carbon, which isn't a very electronegative element. He's just thinking, I am totally unhappy. I don't like this. I don't want to be a base. So that's why it's so hungry for protons. Okay. So if you're like, what was so important about all the missing you? <laughs> the important point is that the reason why strong acids are strong is because the conjugate bases that are produced are relatively stable. Okay. And we're going to evaluate. This is something that you're going to be asked to do on your next quiz and on your final exam. I, I you know, pretty much guarantee that is that I'll ask you to evaluate acid strength of acids that you've probably never even looked at or thought about just by looking at their conjugate bases. And you'll be able to say, well, this conjugate base would be the most stable, so that should be produce the strongest acid, right? This conjugate base should be the least stable, therefore it would be the weakest acid. You see how you're gonna put that all together? 
Now, it can sometimes be a little confusing. I don't want to scare you and say, oh, it's super confusing because it's not super confusing, but it can be a little confusing. And that is why it really takes some practice, you know, to master um, acid base chemistry. If you look at this chapter, right, and I'm sure you all read it before coming to class, it's not the longest chapter in the book by any stretch of the means. But you remember from general chemistry, too, I know you do, that acid base chemistry it's not simple, right? If it was simple, anybody off the street could do it, okay? And again, I'm not saying that to intimidate you. I'm just telling you the reality, okay? Let's take a look at this antihypertensive agent, propranolol. Um, used to treat high blood pressure, of course. It says, using the table, identify the most acidic proton in the compound and indicate the approximate expected pK. Now, if you, I'm sure that there's somebody who's hearing the sound of my voice and going, good grief, Mr. Dion. Come on, get real, buddy. Like there's so many, pro like there's a proton here, there's protons, right? There's protons everywhere. I got protons here. How am I going to figure out, you know, which one? I got protons here. I got this one. I got this one. I got a proton here and this isopropyl. I got a CH3, okay? But if I highlight all of these protons, okay, like these ones, this one, uh, this one here, this one here, this one here, the all of those protons that I'm highlighting and, I'm, you know, I didn't put them all in on this, this one here, okay? Those protons all have something in common. Can anybody tell me what they all have in common? The ones that I've highlighted in yellow. And it's not a trick question. I detest trick questions. They all have something in common. And if, if you have, if you think you know the answer, remember, it doesn't have to be right. This is class. This is a safe space. Anybody have an idea what they all have in common? If we go back a little ways to that table, right? And we talked about three different types of carbon. Yes, Warren, you're 100% correct. I know exactly what you're trying to say, and you're 100% correct, okay? So what Warren is saying is this. He said, well, when we were back here in this table, we looked at a bunch of different carbon-hydrogen bonds, right? We looked at a SP hybridized carbon-hydrogen bond, an sp2 hybridized one and an sp3 and an sp3 is around 50 right that's a big difference between 44 and 25 even the difference between you know 50 and 44 uh 44 is a million times more acidic so that's quite substantial right so what i'm getting at and what warren is getting at sorry to keep singling you out there warren but you get the right answer is um that all of those protons highlighted in yellow they're all sp3 hybridized carbon hydrogen bonds therefore they're all going to have a pka of around 50 okay and if you're saying like what do you mean by around mr dion all i mean is 50 49 you know 48 maybe at the, at the lowest okay but they're all going to be pretty close to each other all right now if i highlight these ones in green that's not going to work very well green on green maybe i could try circling them in red or something i don't know like this these protons all right, could anybody tell me what these, and of course these ones, right? There's this one, there's this one, there's this one, and there's this one. Can anybody tell me what those protons have in common? All these ones that I'm circling in red? There's something in common with all those. Exactly, Bruno, exactly. They're all sp2 hybridized, right? They're all carbon hydrogen bonds, but they're all sp2 hybridized carbon hydrogen bonds. So what was the relative pKa? It was around 44, right? So the pKa is around 44. Well, I'm going to tell you, my friends, that these are not the most acidic protons in the molecule, the ones that are sp3 hybridized or sp2 hybridized carbon hydrogen bonds. Could anybody tell me which one? I'm just going to throw it out there now because there's not many protons left, are there? Could anybody tell me which proton in here would be most acidic or describe it to me? You know a lot about functional groups, so I know you can describe it. Which one of these protons would be the most acidic? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. All right. Bruna is saying, well, there's only two protons left. Okay, so there's, there's this one, right? This is an alcohol, isn't it? Right, that's an alcohol functional group. Now, if you go back to that table, what was the pKa of an alcohol? There was two alcohols in that table, actually. There was ethanol and there was another one called terbutanol. Okay, but either way, 
the difference in acidity between the two alcohols in that table was 100 times. Okay, one was 16, one was 18. So let's just say, I mean, and if you want to do this, where is my pencil? Here we go. If you want to just do this, they're around 16 to 18. Okay, and if you don't believe me, let me show you back here in the table. All right, these are the two alcohols that we saw. Okay, well, these are the alcohols here, but these are their pKs around 16 to 18. So even if you said, hey, you know, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 17, right? Take the difference, or take the average between 16 and 18. It'll still get you the right answer, my friend. Okay, we're not splitting hairs here, right? We're not getting down into, you know, really comparing close numbers. So 16 to 18. And what about this last proton here? Okay, uh, I shouldn't use red, I'll use black, okay? What about this guy here? Well, this is an amine, isn't it? Right, if you go back to that table that I showed you, I said that ammonia has a pK of around 38, and I said, hey, you know what? Other amines are, are close enough. You know, is there a difference between 38 and 18? Yeah, there is. 10 to the power of 20. That is a big difference, my friend. Okay? So there, you can see that there is no splitting hairs here whatsoever. If the pK of this proton is, oops, if the pK of this proton is around 38, okay, you can clearly see if we compare these values, 44, 50, 38, and 16 to 18, even if we call it 18, you can see that the alcohol proton is by far the most acidic, okay? So it's the alcohol proton, which is a pK of, again, around 16 to 18. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. And how did we solve this? We used the table, which would mean you'd have to memorize the table, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, but again, as I told you the other day, you know, you think about any subject that you've learned. And I was in school for a long time. I know that every subject that I studied, there was always some kind of learning curve at the beginning, you know, some kind of table that you had to memorize, whether it was biochemistry and memorizing the amino acids and the three letter and one letter abbreviations or what have you. Anyhow, there you go. So there we go. They were able to look at, a, you know, a pretty complicated molecule. Propranolol is not a simple molecule, not at all. It's got aromatic rings, it's got an ether in it, it's got an alcohol, it's got an amine, you know, you got four different functional groups and we were still able to look at that. And by using that one table, we were able to evaluate um, what was the most acidic proton in the molecule, kind of cool. Let's take a look at this problem here, okay? It says, identify the stronger base in each of the following cases. Now we're gonna solve this, this is section 3.3, so we're gonna solve this, and it doesn't say it in the question, but we're gonna, Using, using table 3.1. Well, remember that when we're talking about the stronger base, okay, the stronger the base, stronger base is going to have the weaker, or the weaker, the weakest conjugate acid, isn't it? Now that table that we had, table 3.1, it didn't have any values about bases, right? The values that we are given are pKa. These are acid dissociation values. These are the values for the acids. But we know that the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. So why don't we take these bases that are in that question, right? They both have negative charges. They're bases, aren't they? Everything in here has got a negative charge. Why don't we take these, draw the conjugate acids, look up the pKa's, compare the pKa's, Whichever one is the weaker acid, that's going to give you the stronger conjugate base. So, and you're going to have to bear with me here. If we draw the conjugate acid of this, which is called acetylide, that's neither here nor there, but the conjugate acid is acetylene. Could anybody tell me what the pKa of this compound would be, this alkyne? And it's not a trick. Just kind of getting the values in our minds. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I recommend printing out the table maybe to help you memorize it. Yes, my students, uh, Bruna and Jessica, both 100% correct. pK of 25. Next, if we take this, this uh, ion is called amide. And if you're like, what? Mr. Dion, didn't you teach me that an amide was this? These are some of the things that will annoy you about science in general. You know, there's so much history in science. But this is a functional group called an amide. Remember, I taught you that. But this is an ion called a polyatomic ion called amide, bit of a pisser, pardon my language. Okay, anyhow, there I'll just delete this. So if, if we have amide, the conjugate acid of amide is ammonia. I don't need to draw the Lewis structure. 
Did anybody memorize the PK of ammonia, or can anybody look it up and tell me what it is? Yep, absolutely. Thanks. PK is 38. Oops, not 3.8, Mr. Dion. 38. So if we compare the two, ammonia is a weaker acid. So we could write that on here. Weaker acid. And therefore, amide is going to be the stronger base. And there you go, my friend. Can never go wrong with PKAs. I want you to remember this specific example, 3.7a, because it's going to come up, or these two um, ions are going to come up later on today. And, I will, uh, you know, this is a really good example of why you can never go wrong with memorizing PKAs. The next one, I didn't do a very good job of separating these, did I? Anyhow, the next one is 3.7b. This is called uh, butoxide, and this is called ethoxide. This is neither here nor there. But again, these are both bases. They have a negative charge. But if we draw their conjugate acids, this is called terbutanol. And the next one is ethanol, which I know you've all heard of. It's added in, you know, gasoline. It's also in alcoholic beverages. If we compare their pKa's, and you can go look at the table, the pKa of uh, terbutanol is 18, whereas the pKa of ethanol is 16. Now that's a lot closer, right? 16 and 18 are much closer numbers than 25 and 38. Okay, they just are. But still, you can see that this acid is 100 times stronger, or its pKa is, a, or, or its uh, relative acidity, I should say, is 100 times more. So since this one is the weaker, weaker acid, acid, this will be, let me get a different color here. This will be the stronger base, stronger base. Give me a thumbs up if you just follow me on the rationale. I don't expect you to have the whole table memorized this, you know, that quickly or anything. I'm not that nutty. But give me a thumbs up if you just follow me on the rationale. If you're like, you know what, give me, you know, give me some time, Mr. Dion, and I'll have it straightened out. Good, great. You know, so what are some strategies you could use for memorizing PKAs? I really don't know. Um, you could really just sit down and look at them and try to memorize them that way. You could try doing practice problems. I have some students who are just hooked on the, the flashcard thing, and that seems to work for some people. I don't know if I told you a story, but. A couple of semesters ago, I came back for organic chemistry too. After uh, the whole summer, and there was a student who hadn't studied organic chemistry in quite some time, and she knew every reaction that we had learned and knew all the PKs. And I asked the student, I said, "How did you do it? You know, you really have a good, you know, memory or something." And she said, "The way that I did it actually was," uh, she said, "I was working in a grocery store all summer, and I had like a key ring with three by five cards on it or something, a little flat." She said, whenever I had a spare second, I would take that out and look at it. She said, but, you know, I had hundreds or a flashcards with all little tidbits of information. She said, by the end of the summer and me looking at them hundreds of times, I just kind of knew everything. So that's a pretty extreme. But, hey, you can't argue with success. So everybody's got to find their their way to um, their favorite way to, to learn those kinds of things. All right. And that's one of the beautiful things about, you know, studying with friends. And I know it's kind of hard. It might be a little bit difficult during the pandemic. Things are easing up now. But one thing that I learned from in school, especially in university more than any other school, was um, studying with a friend. You know, you can really learn a lot from seeing how other people study. If somebody has their microphone on, could you turn it off? There you go. All right. There. Good. All right. Well, let's talk about using pKa values to predict equilibria, right? And you're like, man, I just can't escape the general chemistry too. No, we actually do a quite a bit of, you know, talking about general chemistry too. Remember, you talked a lot about equilibria. And remember Le Chatelier's principle, things like that. And you'd be asked all kinds of questions in general chemistry one and in general chemistry two, where it was like, uh, you know, to which side does the equilibrium lie, right? So we're right back into that right now. Well. Just from those pKa values that you memorize in table 3.1, you can predict which side an equilibrium is going to lie to, okay? Remember that the higher the pKa, the weaker the acid, the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid. Well, here's the answer, okay? The equilibrium is always going to lie to the side of the weaker acid. So if we have our base, this is called terbutoxide. You have your water, which is behaving as your acid. You can even practice drawing your crew just for fun. Okay, you could do that. 
Okay, that's what we talked about last class. Anyhow, so the base is accepting the proton from the acid, who is donating the proton. You know the pK of water, it's 15.7. Um, you look at the conjugate acid, which is terbutanol, which even if you don't know the name, you know the structure, you've seen it. It's got a pKa of 18. Well, it's a weaker acid. So the pK is going to lie to the side of the weaker acid. I want you to remember this so much so that if I see you on the street in six or seven years and I come up to you and I'm like, hey, uh, if I had a, you know, a, a, an equilibrium, which side will it lie to? To the weaker acid or the stronger acid? I'll never forget the first semester I taught at UCCS. I came in, I was teaching organic too. And I asked the students, I said, if I have an equilibrium, which side is the equilibrium going to lie on? Is it going to lie on the side of the strong acid, the weak acid? And I think almost everybody said the strong acid. You could have knocked me over with a feather. I was like, what? You know, think about it. If we go back to, you know, Mr. Dion's hammer and tongs approach here of trying to explain concepts in chemistry. Okay, let me take my, put my camera on here. All right, if we think about the function of an acid being able to donate protons, right? What did I say? The stronger the pro, the stronger the acid rather is going to donate protons more, right? It's stronger. It's pushing, right? Whereas a weak acid is meh, meh, going to donate a proton. So if I have a big strong acid and if I have a little weak acid and they're pushing on each other, who's going to win? The strong one. So it's going to lie. The strong one's going to do its job very well, and the equilibrium is going to lie on the side of the weak one. Right, because the strong one did its job. It's donating protons, so it's going to lie to the side of the weak one. Now, it's not always on this side. It could be on this side. Anyhow, there you go. So hopefully that'll help you a little bit. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Thought I pressed the share screen button. No. Back. Here we go. Boom. Now you, should, now you should be able to see it. All right. Does that help a little bit? My demonstration of the weak acid versus the strong. Think of a strong person and a weak person pushing against each other. Which side is the pushing match going to lie to? Well, the strong person is going to knock the weak person or it's going to lie to the side of the weaker person. Cha? No? Okay. Maybe it helps. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. All right, it's kind of the way I think of things, but hey, everybody's got to sort things out in their own mind to some extent. Well, here we go. Here's another reaction where we have this base accepting a proton from water. Then we have our conjugate acid, which has a pKa of 50 in our conjugate base. Well, look at this. If you go back to the last slide, did you notice that we had equilibrium arrows, right? If you look at the difference in relative acidity around 16 and 18, but if you go to the next slide, you notice that the arrow is in one direction. It's a unidirectional arrow. Well, the reason why is you look at the difference of pK 16 and 50. Ay, ay, ay. That's a value. That's a 34 log units. That's 10 to the power of 34. That is a big difference, my friend. Okay. So when you've got a huge difference in pKa values, you just write an irreversible arrow because the reverse reaction is basically irrelevant. Okay. There we go. So here we go, the Bronsted-Lowry qualitative perspective. So once you've memorized the table, table 3.1, and you're very confident in that, and you think, I'm good to go, we're going to take a look, or you're going to move on to section 3.4, which deals with the qualitative perspective. Now, this is one that can really get you out of a jam, because this is where you're just going to look at the molecule without knowing pKa's, maybe, and just saying, hey, I think I can figure this out just from the structure. And this is, there's a technique in here, or an acronym that we use in this textbook. It's called ARIO, A-R-I-O, which means Atom Resonance Induction Orbital. And I'll explain what that means. I'll explain it in detail. But this was invented by Dr. Klein himself. So David Klein uh, came up with this. I, ne I never saw this when I was a student, this whole ARIO concept. But I've taught it several times, and my students really like it. And it works very well. So let's follow along here. It says to determine the relative strength of two acids without knowing their pKa values, we look at the stability of their conjugate bases. Now, we did a question like that, right? Question 3.5, where we, we took the conjugate bases, then we determined the pKa's. But we did it quantitatively that time. Now we're going to look at it qualitatively, right? Because the stronger the acid, the more stable its conjugate base. So in order for us to evaluate how stable a conjugate base is, we're actually looking at the lone pair, 
right? Because when you form a conjugate base, you're going to have some lone pair. And we're just saying, like, how stable is that lone pair? Is that lone pair content where it is? Or is it like, I don't like being a lone pair. I want to give me a proton again, okay? So the more effectively that that conjugate base can stabilize its negative charge, the stronger the acid, right? I tried to introduce you to this concept earlier today when I said, why is the hydrogen sulfate such a weak base? It's because this negative charge is so dang content where it is, okay? It's because the conjugate base of sulfuric acid, this guy is so stable. So here are the four main factors that uh, affect that negative charge. The atom, which I tried to keep it in red, and resonance, induction, and orbital. You put those all together and you get this sassy little acronym, okay? Aereo. So you're going to memorize that and you're going to use it all throughout organic chemistry, organic chemistry one, organic chemistry two. If you're one of my students who's interested in writing a standardized exam, maybe an MCAT exam or a DAT exam or a PCAT exam or, you know, uh, anything that involves organic chemistry later, you're going to use this guy. Okay, you're going to find that uh, it's going to come in really handy. So let's go through them. Let's go through Aereo. A, I told you, stands for atom, the type of atom that carries the charge. Here we can determine whether an oxygen or a carbon is going to better stabilize the charge. Look, you've got a carbon with a negative charge and you've got an oxygen on the in it with a negative charge. If you look at the second period, you see that it goes boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. You guys all know that electronegativity increases going across a period. And therefore, oxygen is more electronegative. It's got an electronegativity of 3.5, whereas carbon is only 2.5. Therefore, oxygen is going to be better at stabilizing that negative charge. Now, that is actually summarized. Come on, you. That is actually summarized in this point right here. Since carbon and oxygen are in the same period, okay, they're in the same period, they're similar sizes. I mean, the oxygen's a little smaller, but they're close in size. The more electronegative atom is going to better stabilize that negative charge. Now, if you're just thinking, hey, all I have to do is look at electronegativity and hot dog, we have a wiener. There we go. That's, that's the answer. Well, it's only the answer when we're looking at atoms stabilizing a negative, a negative charge when the atoms are in the same period. If they're in the same group, we don't look at the electronegativity. When they're in the same group, we look at the size. Now, let me show you an example of that. It says here, what about water versus hydrogen sulfide? If I write out the structure of water, H2O, right? If I draw its Lewis structure, H2O, and everybody could draw that, versus hydrogen sulfide, H2S. If we draw its Lewis structure, very similar. If we draw their conjugate bases, right? I would have a hydroxide. Okay, and then I would have a hydrosulfide. So this is called hydrosulfide here. Now, which one of these is a stronger acid? Is it water or is it H2S? Now, what I told you is that the way that you compare their relative acidities is that you look at the conjugate basis. So which one of these conjugate bases is more stable? If you were to go off of electronegativity, you would say, you would think, well, oxygen is the second most electronegative element in the periodic table. Therefore, it's going to be, you know, this one's going to be more stable. Therefore, water is a stronger acid. But in fact, it's not true because remember, oxygen and sulfur are in the same group. So let's write that here. So um, same group, same group. And over here, it was the same period. So if we go down a group like this, we get an increase, increase, in size okay so the oxygen is like this whereas the sulfur is like this it's much bigger and since the size of the sulfur is bigger it gets it is um, better at stabilizing that negative charge it's more spread out therefore since this conjugate base is more stable this is going to be a stronger acid and if you compare their pka so i'm going to reveal the answer now okay the pk of water you already know is 15.7, whereas the pK of hydrogen sulfide is around 7. Okay, it's significantly more acidic. So again, to review, when we're dealing with atom, right, we're looking at the negative charge on an atom. When the two atoms are in the same period, right, carbon and oxygen, we go off of electronegativity. Okay, when the two atoms 
right? Here we have oxygen and sulfur. They're in, they're not in the same period. They're in the same group, right? They're both in group six, oops. They're both in group uh, 6A, okay? So since they're in the same group or family, we go off of size. Since sulfur is bigger, it's gonna be more effective at stabilizing that, that charge. And there we go. So dominant effect is size. When we're in the same group or family, we're in the same period, the dominant effect will be electronegativity. Okay, so we've covered the first one, Ariel. So what comes next? The letter R and the concept of resonance. What if I was looking at these two conjugate bases? Okay, if I have this conjugate base, okay, that's called an ethoxide. So I'll put it in the yellow box. And this one here, this is acetate. Well, if I'm trying to use Ariel, I can't use the letter A because the negative charge in both of these is on an oxygen atom. Okay, so that doesn't work. So I move on to resonance. Now, what is resonance? Re resonance shows the delocalization of electrons. Remember that we said the more resonance structures that we had or the more resonance contributors that we had overall to the resonance hybrid, the more stable it was, right? The more stable that resonance um, uh, or that uh, ion or molecule was. And so since there are no resonance structures here, there's no resonance structures that can be drawn, but there are two resonance structures for the acetate, it's more stable. Therefore, more stable base is going to be the result of that stronger acid. So it tells you that their conjugate acid, the conjugate acid here would be this, okay, and the conjugate acid here, and I know they're written below, but the conjugate acid here would be this. Now, if you're like, well, Mr. Dion, I remember memorizing those from the table, or I saw them in table 3.1. Couldn't we have just used that? Sure, I guess so. I don't have any problem with that. But if you go back to that table, it's just proof, right? The pK of ethanol is what? It was around 16, and the pK of acetic acid was 4.75. We'll just call it 5, okay? 4.75 and 5 are close enough, okay? Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on atom and resonance. And if you need me to re-explain one of them, let me know. Cha 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 cha. Does everybody follow me on the concept of atom and resonance? Good. Okay. <clears throat> well, I haven't asked you many questions this morning. I have a quick one. I noticed. I'm look. I always look at my notes. You know, what did I write down? I always try to write down things that I want to share with you. You know, things that I. Maybe I've forgotten some years, things I don't definitely don't want to leave out. But I wrote down a little problem that I came up with here, or maybe I think of it. But this one here, if I I have a question for you guys. If I circle this proton in red and I circle this circle this proton in blue, I just want to quiz you, just a quick quiz on this concept, or these first two concepts, I should say, atom and resonance. Could anybody tell me which one of these protons would be more acidic? Would it be the one in blue or the one in red? And it's not a trick. I just want to see if you follow me a little bit on this. Be the blue one or the red one? Yes, thanks, Kelly. Absolutely. You're 100% correct. Why did Kelly say, and Warren and, John, and Jonathan, why is everybody saying it's the blue one? Right, it's because you guys are following me, and you know that when you make the carbon ion there, if you rip off that proton, right, this is a carbon and this is a carbon. You can't use atom to solve that problem, can you? But you can use resonance, can't you? Right, if I deprotonate here, I get no resonance contributors, whereas here I get a beautiful resonance contributor, don't I? Right, and I'll let you draw the other resonance contributor, but you solve that using resonance. Absolutely great, excellent. You get the best students, okay? When you teach organic chemistry, you teach the best students at school, whatever school you're in. Uh, let's see here. Next, you know, your students aren't scared, right? Your students aren't afraid of anything if they study organic chemistry, right? Uh, the next one we go from atom to resonance to induction. You guys remember uh, uh, dipoles, right? We spent quite a bit of time in chapter one talking about polar bonds, okay? And we explain how if you have a polar bond, um, when we draw a dipole, let's say we draw HCl, for example, okay, just a simple Lewis structure, and I draw a dipole going this way, okay, the arrow points towards the more electronegative atom, and it's the one that's sucking electron density towards itself. And so that chlorine is going to have partial negative, whereas the hydrogen is going to have a partial 
um, uh, positive charge. So basically that negative charge, or sorry, that chlorine, since it's more electronegative, it pulls electron sources. So anyhow, I'm probably going into too much detail here. But the whole concept of induction is this. Follow along, it says induction can also stabilize a formal charge by spreading it out. How is induction different from resonance? Well, when we had resonance, we could actually see the delocalization of the electrons because we can draw resonance contributors. We don't draw induction contributors, okay? We don't draw anything like that. But if we were to draw the conjugate base of acetic acid, and I know you've seen it many times already in this class, okay? It's the acetate ion. Here's the negative charge. Is it stabilized by um, that oxygen being electronegative? Hell yeah. Is it stabilized by resonance? Yeah. But if I draw the conjugate base of this, of trichloroacetic acid, I'm going to need more space. Need more space. Okay, it's going to look like this. I've got a bond of chlorine here. I've got another bond of chlorine here. I'm going to leave the lone pairs and the chlorines out. But you can't use atom because the negative charge here is on an oxygen and the negative charge here is on an oxygen. So that doesn't work. What did I do that for? Don't know. Let me go back so that I can find everything that I did was erased. Okay, where was I? There we go. Okay. So you can't use atom. Now I can't erase those circles. There we go. Okay, so we can't use atom. We can't use resonance because you can draw the exact same resonance structures for both of those. Son of a gun. Sorry, everybody. But you can use induction. Why? Because this conjugate base, that negative charge, this one right here is further stabilized by the inductive effects of these electron withdrawing chlorines, right? Because when I say electron withdrawing, it's because they're more electronegative than carbon, right? Chlorine has an electronegativity of around three. So it's sucking electron density towards itself. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the concept of induction as to, you know, that those chlorines, those dipoles are serving to stabilize that negative charge. Good, good. This one's a, a little more conceptual, you know, because you're not drawing a resonance structure, right? You're not just qualifying it with, you know, size or electronegativity or something like that. So if I was to ask you to, you know, let's say I gave you these four compounds, these four carboxylic acids on your next quiz. And I said, you know, which one of these is the most acidic? You can't, you know, if you look at Ario, A, R, I, O. If you draw the conjugate bases of all of these, right? These are the acidic protons here on the carboxylic acids. You can't solve it using atom because the conjugate base is going to have the negative charge on the oxygen for all four of them. You can't solve it using resonance because they all have the same resonance contributors. Right, I could draw it for the acetate ion, and I'm sure that you can draw it even faster than me by now. All right, you just draw like this, okay? And then you draw the other resonance contributor. There we go, okay? So all four of these have the same resonance contributors. The only thing that's different is the R group here, right? That changes. So you can't solve it using resonance, but you can solve it using induction. Right, because this R group here is a methyl, a CH3. It's got no electron withdrawing groups. Here we've got only one. So you see that there's a decrease in the pKa. This becomes, it becomes more acidic, right? The pKa is dropping. Then once we add, we throw another chlorine on there. Look at that. Now we're getting to something. Now we're getting pretty acidic, aren't we? Down to a pKa of 1.25. And then once you put in three chlorines, ay ay ay, la policia, right? Then you've got something you know, three inductive effects. Um, so you're getting something that's even more acidic. So I have a question for you. I'm going to quiz you on this now. What if I had this carboxylic acid? Okay. Would this carboxylic acid be more acidic than anything on here? Or would it be less acidic than everything on here? More or less, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. More? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. I couldn't agree more, you guys. Great. And I know you know why, okay? You're probably like, Mr. Dion, you're too slow. Speed it up. Well, I don't want to go too fast, okay, in case somebody's confused. But you all know that fluorine is the most electronegative element in the periodic table. You got three crazy electron withdrawing effects that would stabilize the negative charge of the conjugate base, right? The conjugate base that would result. 
And so the pKa of this compound, this is called trifluoroacetic acid or TFA. We call it TFA. We use it all the time in organic chemistry. It's got a pKa of 0 0.23. Okay, so it's even much more acidic than trichloroacetic acid. Okay, how did we explain that? We explained all this using induction. All right, now I know you're probably following me and you're like, get on to, you know, finish, put, put an amen to it, preacher. Okay, well, let's move on and talk about the last one, orbital. So you have atom induction, or sorry, atom resonance, induction, and orbital. Well, the type of orbital can also affect the stability of a negative charge. Let me show you what, how. Like, if you think about, you know, some PKs that we saw, and I'm just going to get ahead of myself here a little bit for fun. You remember we looked at this conjugate base, right? And we said that its conjugate acid had a pK. I'll put it in brackets because this isn't an acid. It had a pK of 44, whereas when you had ethane, the conjugate base of ethane, okay, like this, its conjugate acid had a pK of 50. Again, I'm putting it in brackets because these are not acids. These are bases. However, why, why is the conjugate acid of this you know, more acidic, right? It's got to have, you, you're not solving it using atom, right? If we think about aereo, come on. If we think about aereo, you're not solving it using atom because the negative charge is on carbon in both cases. You're not solving it using resonance, right? You can't even draw a resonance structure for that. You're not solving it using induction. There's no electron withdrawing anything on here. You're going to have to solve this using orbital because the hybridization of this carbon is sp2 and the hybridization here um, is sp3 okay so you're gonna have to differentiate between the two pka values using the hybridization or the type of orbital so the closer the electrons are held to the nucleus the more stable they are if you compare the relative sizes of an sp3 and sp2 and an sp hybridized orbital i know that i showed you in chapter one that i said look you guys all you have to do is draw this, and then you just label it. You can, you can write sp3, sp2, or sp, and Mr. Dion is going to be, you know, happy as, you know, um, a, a pig in mud, right? But you know that when you go from an sp3 to an sp2 to an sp, they do actually get smaller and smaller. And so what's the answer? Since this lone pair here is in an sp2 hybridized orbital, it's smaller, right, than the sp3 hybridized orbital. Therefore, what? The lone pair, the electrons, are actually closer to the nucleus. What's the charge of a nucleus? It's positively charged. Since they're closer to that positively charged nucleus, they're more stable. Now, if you want me to make it as simple as possible, if you're like, Mr. Dion, please distill into the simplest possible bit. Allow me to do that, my friends, okay? The simplest possible bits would be this. This carbon is sp3 hybridized, this one is sp2, and this one is sp. As you go from sp3, to sp2 to sp the hybrid the, uh, the the pk drops right why because if you look at the conjugate base here right this negative charge okay that's in an sp hybridized orbital that's a lot smaller and therefore the lone pair is held very tightly to the nucleus and therefore it's going to be a lot more stable than the conjugate base that you would get here that is an sp3 hybridized orbital and that's that's all there is if you're like is that the answer it's just based on the size of the orbital yep that's it. Nothing more than that. So as long as you understood hybridization, you will be, you know, rock solid on this kind of stuff. So we go from an sp hybridized orbital, sp2, to an sp3. And again, the smaller the orbital, the more stable the lone pair is going to be, and the stronger uh, the conjugate acid will be. So there you go. We learned all three of them. Here we go. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the whole concept of atom, resonance, induction, orbital. Like that's that's a pretty good concept. I think I could I think I could get into that. All right. So um, if you can remember this, and I'll tell you what, when I get to organic chemistry two, and let's say I have students, so SP is going to be the most acidic, right? If you have a carbon-hydrogen bond and you're comparing it to other carbon-hydrogen bonds, the one that's in the smallest or smallest sized hybrid orbital is going to give you the most. Um, it's going to give you the lowest pKa for the conjugate acid, is how I should say. 
All right. There we go. So, you know, what's funny about the whole concept of Aereo is that when I get into organic chemistry too with my students, even if it's somebody who hasn't taken organic chemistry, you know, maybe over the summer they didn't take it or, you know, if they missed a semester or something, they're like, oh, you know, it just didn't fit into my schedule, is that when I ask them a question about relative acidity, even if they don't remember the acronym, A-R-I-O, they'll always have the basics of the concept in their head. It's pretty interesting. The students seem to always remember this. So just follow along with me here. I'm just reading off the slide. It says, when you're assessing the acidity of protons, we generally, notice that generally is un underlined, we generally use Aereo as the order important of these stabilizing effects, atom, resonance, induction, orbital. Let me say here unequivocally, and you can take me to the bank on this one, okay? A better way of doing this is always, to, is always knowing pKa's, okay? Because you cannot argue with a pKa. Those are numbers that are set in stone, right? If you were to, you know, talk to somebody who is an organic chemist by trade, and it's what they do for a living, or, some, you know, somebody who's re a retired organic chemist here, he will always have, you know, many, 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 many pKa values memorized. And if you show them a molecule that they've never seen before, they'll be able to come up with pretty good ideas of what the pKa value should be, okay? They'll be able to get it nine times out of 10. So pKa values, I would say, are best. However, Aereo is going to be handy oh, almost a Avogadro's number of times in organic chemistry. And I'm going to get you to apply it too. I'm going to get you to use it. But what I want you to know about Aereo is this. Not 100% reliable. Okay, there are exceptions to Aereo. Aereo can be used, and if you're wondering, you know, like, oh, Mr. Dion, could you tell me how often I could use it? No, I can't. I can say that you can use it most of the time. However, there are exceptions. Let me show you one of the most important exceptions that's going to come up in organic chemistry. Remember 3.5? I said, make a note of this question in your mind, because here is that example right there. Remember, we compared the relative stability of these two conjugate bases, okay? Or sorry, no, we didn't. We compared their pKa values. Well, the problem is, if you were looking at this equilibrium right here, and I didn't give you the pKa values, if you're like, well, Mr. Dion, I know that the equilibrium is gonna lie to the side. You, should, you gave me the pKa of the conjugate acid, and you gave me the pKa of the acid. The, P, the equilibrium is gonna lie to the side of the weaker acid. Bada boom, bada bing. Okay, now the reason that we know that is because we know pKa values. And I told you that you can always hit your wagon to pKa values. However, follow along with me here. I know there's a lot of text, but think about it. If we had judged this using Aereo, right, where would we have started? If we have A, R, I, O, we would have started with the atom because here you have the negative charge on a nitrogen and here it is on a carbon. We would have said, well, come on. You have boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Uh, yes, uh, let's see here. Nitrogen is more electronegative than a carbon. Therefore, the negative charge will be more stable on the nitrogen. Notice I'm using a funny voice because it's not true, okay? Or not true in this case. But we can use this to rationalize and say that this will be, um, uh, will give us the uh, more stable conjugate base. Therefore, the weaker acid, uh, you know, and we would have gotten the wrong answer, right? Or sorry, uh, sorry, no, what am I saying here? We would have said that the negative charge is more content on the nitrogen, which is more electronegative. Yes, so the equilibrium, we would have said it would have lied to this side if we were using area, okay? And we would have been incorrect, okay? So that's why I wanted to go over this particular example with you. Again, since I kind of misspoke there, I was kind of thinking of something else. If you compare the negative charge here on this nitrogen and the negative charge on the carbon and you use a r i o you start at a both of these are different atoms nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon therefore if you used aereo you would assume that the equilibrium would lie more to the side of the reactants why because the negative charge is going to be more stable on the nitrogen okay but that is not true in this case okay we can't use aereo in this particular case we actually have to go off of pka values now, if you're wondering, Mr. Dion, are you going to ask me a bunch of examples like this? Or are you going to try to confuse me over and over and over? Of course not. My job is not to try to trick you. Okay? My job is to try to test you. And is this a specific example that I expect you to know? Yes, absolutely. I expect you to know this uh, exception. I should put it like that. Okay, so the conclusion is this. What's the take-home message from Aereo? 
uh, for some assets, we just need to know the PK values because there are some exceptions. But as for your next quiz, this will, I think, be the only exception that I will expect you to know. Okay, let's move on from there and let's take a look at a problem. We've got red and blue protons here, and we're just asked to, you know, determine which one is going to be more acidic in each of the compounds. You can either use PKs, my friend, or you can use Aereo. Either way, now we're getting into just, just figuring it out, right? Okay. Let's see. So let's start with the first one. So we have A, we got a red proton. Maybe I'll put both of these on here. Could anybody tell me which one of these would be more acidic, the red proton or the blue proton in A? And again, none of these are tricks, okay? None of them are trying to screw you up or ruin your life or anything. Just trying to test you. Do you understand? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Okay, so Jessica says it's the red one. I, th I say she's right. Could anybody, including Jessica or anybody else, could anybody tell me why? And you can use whatever rationalization you want. Just give me your best ex explanation. Yeah, so somebody says it's an alcohol. I could do one better than that. If you go back to table 3.1, you remember that we talked about alcohols, right? And we said that the pK of an alcohol is around 16 to 18. But if you remember in that table, it also had a phenol. And a phenol is much more acidic than a regular alcohol. Okay? A phenol has a pK of around 10. And so the pK of this proton is around 10. So it's, I think it's 9.9 .9 in the table, but we'll, whatever, we'll say it's around 10. And this is an sp2 hybridized carbon hydrogen bond. So it's got a pK, according to that table, around 44. I told you that an aromatic proton has a pKa of around 40. Okay, around 40, like that. Okay, so you, first of all, you could have used the pKa values. That's one way, and that's using table, table 3.1 to solve this problem. But you also could use Aereo, couldn't you? Because if you draw the conjugate base from the removal of the red proton, okay, Not only is the negative charge on an oxygen compared to on a carbon, but there's resonance structures here, aren't there? And that's what's most important is that you have a whole bunch of resonance contributors there that you could draw. All right, let's take a look at the next one. We have the red proton and the blue proton. Who could tell me which one is more acidic here, red or blue? Red proton versus blue proton. Make a good reality show, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All my students are saying it's the red one, and you're 100% correct. Right? The red one, if you go to table 3.1, the pK of a ketone proton was around 19, 19-ish. Whereas the pK of a 1,3-dicarbonyl, right? We have 1, 2, 3 dicarbonyl, that pKa is around 9. So it's, you know, 10 to the power of 10, which is just a big number, okay? Now, if you think about the conjugate bases, that would result from the abstraction of the red proton, right? You would have this, and I'll just draw a quick version here, and you can draw a resonance contributor up here, right? Or you could draw a resonance contributor up here. So that is doubly resonance stabilized, whereas when you draw the conjugate base of what results from the abstraction of the blue proton, you end up with this carbanion for which you can, oops, that's my negative charge, for which you can only draw one resonance contributor, right? So more resonance, resonance contributors, okay? So if we think about Aereo, we couldn't use atom, but we could use resonance to solve this one. And the last one, I think the best way to do the last one is really just to memorize the pKa values from the table. You've got a carboxylic acid and you've got an amine. So, you know, I think it's handy to memorize that the pKa of a carboxylic acid 
I don't know why I keep putting lowercase k's in there. PKA is around five ish. And the PKA of the mean was around what, 38? Okay. Um, here we go. PKA around 38. Something that you notice about that mean, though, this, these blue protons, is if you were to deprotonate those, you would have a resonance structure, wouldn't you? Right? If you draw this, I'm just going to draw part of the molecule. So if you were to draw this, the conjugate base, right, you would have a resonance structure like this. Okay? But either way, the negative charge would be on a nitrogen versus an oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative. So you can solve it using the atom right away, the negative charge, even though there's a resonance structure for both. The atom oxygen is more electronegative. So even if, you know, in the pKa here, it should be less than, it should be less than 38. But still, I mean, it's, it's such a huge difference between 38 and 5 that it's definitely, there's going to be no argument. It's going to be the carboxylic acid. All right, and I recommend that you try some other practice problems, uh, like the ones that are in practice of skill 3.23. These things like um, skill builders and practice the skill that are in our textbook, authored by David Klein himself. I mean, these things are excellent tools for students to use in mastering the content. It's almost like you can go back in the book and watch him or read uh, while he reteaches like little parts of it that he knows that are, can be troublesome for students, right? Organic chemistry is not as simple subject. So um, it can be really handy to go back and take a look at those. All right.